Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. Hi, everybody. Vivian, grateful, recovered alcoholic. And I was sitting back over here relishing the fact that I was going to be last. I don't have a clue what I'm going to talk about. What's the topic? Oh, so anyway, um, the gifts of sobriety. The gifts of sobriety are that I get to be present, consciously sober, aware, in love with you, and to come here and have open arms no matter where I am in the world. And the things you have given to me are gifts that are indescribable and priceless. You know, you've given me the gift of the heart. And um, for that, I can never thank you enough. But more importantly, you've given me a, a life with my son. I can be the mom that I never could be when I was younger and he was a, a child. Um, I can be a grandma now and and I'm like, where's Katie? And then I picked my name too, Gammy. Don't call me anything but Gammy. And that works for me. Um, and I tell my little grandson every time I talk to him, every single time, call me on the phone the other night and I said, don't forget, honey, don't ever forget that you're more precious than rubies. He says, I know, Gammy. <laughs> and, um, you know, just to be able to have a relationship, to have a friendship, Um, to be respectful of that friendship, to know that I can be there and that you can be there for me. Those are the gifts that have been passed along from my sponsorship, from my sponsor to my sponsor's sponsor, from all those people way before me. It's like, you know, the lighthouse of recovery, as with the ships passing in the sea, AA is the beam and the lighthouse, the sunlight of the spirit that brings us all home, gives us a life, second to none. God bless you, and thanks for letting me share. Hi, my name's George. I'm an alcoholic. That's an extra five minutes for you. because she. <laughs> I'm so grateful to be sober, and with this topic, I was like, ah, you know, it's all, all, everything about my sobriety is a gift. I came to Alcoholics Anonymous 21 years ago with the the goal of just not wanting to hate myself so much, and um, I was so lonely and so empty. I had... I had skills for living because I was still alive at that point, but I I did not really know how to truly live or how to truly love. And through, you know, I got sober at 24, so I did a lot of learning and growing and mistake making in front of God and y'all, everybody. And, um, but by doing that, I I have this freedom in my life today. Uh, I, I had no idea what joy was. I didn't know that I was someone who could ever experience that. Um, and I have freedom today. And, and probably I think if I were, I was trying to think of like, okay, if I had to pick like, what is the greatest gift of my sobriety, it would be the freedom in knowing that all I'm responsible for today is my side of the street, that that is where the power is, is on my side of the street. I spent years and years trying to get you to fill me up, to make me complete to somehow fill that emptiness I had inside and with always the belief that if somebody loved me, then I would be okay. And um, what I've come to find out is that in getting sober, that the only way that that emptiness gets filled is by giving, it's by being of service. And today, the way I love is measured not in what I'm receiving, but it's in all of the people that I love. You know, I have so many friends. I have a sponsor who knows every dark nook and cranny of my being. She's been my sponsor for 19 years. <laughs> she's only been my sponsor for a couple of days. No, she's been my sponsor for 19 years and she still loves me. And there's such power in that because I was always afraid if you really knew who I was, you wouldn't love me. And um, today when I wake up, I get to, I, 
I think about the day ahead, you know, and I, I want to be a good employee, a good friend, a good sponsor, sponsee, et cetera. And then I start my day and you commit friendship crimes and you're late and I don't like people who are late and you try and ruin who I decided I was going to be in the morning. Um, <laughs> But what I realize is that um, the only thing I'm responsible is for keeping my side of the street clean. And if I do that, at the end of the day, when my head hits the pillow, um, you know, I, I get to stay sober another day and I get to feel that joy and I get to take loving actions even with people that I don't think necessarily deserve them or will enjoy them as much as I think they should. And when I'm taking those loving actions, I'm experiencing love. So whether or not the person receives it that way, as I'm giving it, I'm experiencing it. So, um, so love always wins. And so that's what I mean by I came here so empty, and today I, I have so much love in my life, and it's not just the love that I receive, which I, I is good. It's good to receive, but that's never filled the emptiness in me. Today it's the love I feel for all of you, and, and the speakers this weekend have absolutely blown me away. I, I am in, a, in awe of all of these ladies, and um, I'm just so grateful to be sober, and, and I'll talk to you some more in the morning. Thank you. <laughs> Hi, everybody. I'm Donna. I'm an alcoholic. <laughs> the gifts of sobriety. Holy cow. You know, how do you even talk about that? I know when I, when I, when I came here, I was a crippled individual. I was very, very crippled. You know, um, I was less than a wad of gum on the bottom of somebody's shoe. You know, I mean, I just, honest to God, had no future. I had no hope. Um, I didn't know. I mean, it's really different times. I was thinking back at different times in my life when I thought, I need to find out who I am. Okay, I'm 63, and I'm still looking for that. I mean, I, I still want to know, like, what do I want to be ultimately? I mean, like, that's, you know, not just today. You know, I want to know what I want to be ultimately. Well, I just, you know, all that time I've wasted, uh, missing today because I've been worrying about what the last pump pump is supposed to be, <laughs> you know? Um, like when they yank the sheet off a statue. Boom, there it is, you know? Finished product. Um, Alcoholics Anonymous isn't like that. It takes crippled people, emotionally damaged, crippled little doves that we are, and turns us into the real thing. You know, turns us turns us into strong women. Um, you know, life is never going to be perfect, but it's perfect today. It's perfect. It's exactly the way it's supposed to be. I've been given friendships. I've been given true love. You know, uh, I never experienced that in my life. I had not. I never experienced that at home, in school, nothing. I wanted to be invisible. You know, I wanted to just hide. And I thought that if I could just be invisible and go away, that, you know, I could cut my losses a little bit. And AA has allowed me the freedom to step out and be who I am. You know, allowed me to reveal those fears. They talk about in AA being as sick as your secrets. You know, that you can die as being as, as sick as your secrets. And one of the biggest ways that I kept secrets in here in these rooms was that I wouldn't tell you I am so afraid. I wouldn't tell you I'm so angry and I hurt so bad. And I feel like I've been betrayed that my kids are dying and there's nothing I can do. I wouldn't tell you. I shoved that stuff back under the rug and I'm fine. And I would come in the rooms and I would say the words but there was no music, you know. There was no music. And I, you can die in AA doing that. Mm -hmm. And I nearly died in AA doing that. And today, if anything, one of the things that I do the most is I tell the truth. I mean, when the wheels are falling off, I talk about it. You know, when I am angry or resentful, I talk about it. You know, I can call Polly and say, I am so mad at so-and-so today for this, this, or this. 
And never once has she said to me, you know, uh, angry anger is the dubious luxury of normal people, and you're not one of those. You know, <laughs> I mean, she's never, she's never, you know, tried to make it go away. She's always said, you know, she's always said, usually said to me. I know what you mean about that. I've had feelings like that before, too. About the, about the only thing I can tell you is try this, you know. And sometimes it's a really simple little solution. And uh, and I'm willing to do it because I, I don't want to be the same woman that I am today as time goes on, you know. I want to continue to be useful. Um, I love my life. I love this cowboy that I'm married to. You know, he's he's my third husband. Yeah, I was counting. <laughs> <laughs> and he's like this six foot four, big old cowboy, hat, belt buckle, boots, wranglers. Oh yeah. <laughs> Montana. And he, you know, we live on a farm out there, and he is country all the way. I mean, he's just about as country as you get. And uh, I just adore him, and I would have missed that. You know, uh, I remember when Dave Thistle used to tell me, you don't, you don't need to find the right man. You just need to be the right woman. You know, and, and I spent several years learning about you know, who my higher power is and learning about developing a relationship with my higher power. And because of doing that, I was healthy enough to be able to be in a relationship with this guy based on a different basis than ever I had done before. In fact, I actually fell in love with Bob before I ever kissed him or held his hand. And that is not the progression that I ever took before. <laughs> I was be like, oh, that was good. What's your name? <laughs> no. You know, and, we, and our, lives, our lives are not perfect because we're not perfect. We're human beings. But I, I love him, and he loves me. He treats me like a queen. He, I was telling Polly this a while ago. She, he, uh, he wore out. Uh, I always sleep on my right side. And he sleeps, he cuddles up behind me and he rubs my right, my left cheek. And he, he has worn two pair of pajamas off that have, that have holes in them. And I was folding them one day and I was like, hmm, I wonder where this side has holes and this one doesn't. And then I realized Bob wore them out rubbing my butt at night. You know? I mean, I don't know about you, but it don't get no better than that. <laughs> you know, I have three daughters who love me and respect me, and they are healthy women who have lives of their own. Um, I adore them. I adore them. Uh, I have seven beautiful grandchildren and, uh, you know, six granddaughters, one grandson. And they're, you know, they're just amazing, amazing kids. And I watch these women who are very spiritually founded raising their families, and I think, how in the world did you learn that? And they tell me, it's from you, Mom. But I don't know how they learned that from me because I was a drunk. You know, and Alcoholics Anonymous has taken all those things and turned them into valuable assets. And, I mean, I could stand here all night. It's, it's, a, it's a cheat to try to talk about the value, the, the assets, the good, you know, the rewards of sobriety in five minutes. So I, I'll shut up now. Thank you. <laughs> Katie, alcoholic. Uh, the progression, I like that term. It's how I progressed with the young man. Um, we, we clean up our words so nicely. And Laura seems over here going, maybe you ought to wear pajamas, Katie. The... And well, when you're not wearing pajamas, that hand goes from the butt all over the place fast. You know what I mean? But, uh, oh. In 10 minutes, let me try to tell you how grateful I am. Oh, my gosh. First of all, you guys are my tribe. There is no doubt about it. I mean, the only room I ever feel comfortable with or in is in Alcoholics Anonymous. I have been in many other organizations. And this, this one is, you're just my people. 
And uh, and I can tell you, you know, you, you heard my story about being all over the place. Um, what I'm grateful for today is I never knew I could be so happy. I, I absolutely, after I lost Joe, and, and it was a 20-year marriage, which wasn't, you know, skipping down the yellow brick road, you know. I mean, there was lots of trouble. There was, we, at his funeral, I got up to speak and, of course, said the F word twice. And, uh, <laughs> but, um, you know, and my daughter's, you know, uh, elementary school librarian was there. And, you know, she'd already graduated college by then, but gone to Christian school. It was lovely. But um, the um, the thing I can tell you is is that uh, I... I talked about how we fell out of love about five different times because marriage is peaks and valleys, peaks and valleys. It's very difficult. Anyone who's been married a while knows. But I can tell you after I lost Joe, I really, really didn't think I could ever be happy again. I'm in those bedevilments. And today what I can tell you in in, uh, the the last 45 minutes I have here is uh, that... I have fallen in love again, and I'm telling you, you know, no matter what anybody says, I think everybody really wants some partnership with someone. I don't care if it's your neighbor. You know what I mean? I mean, you want a partner. You want to be able to sit down and talk with someone, and I have I have fallen uh, crazy in love with a guy who was my best friend, and he was the one who really did save my life. Uh, when I was in untreated alcoholism, he drugged me to these events. I didn't want to go. You can tell I'm not an easy personality to get along with, and uh, and he, he kept dragging me and kept dragging me and kept dragging me and I had met him when he had six months sober and he was Joe and I my husband and I's uh, best friend and and uh, I ended up marrying this guy and and I never knew somebody could Joe loved me like crazy I mean he thought I was the 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 moon and I didn't think anyone else would love me like that again and Charlie loves me like that I like to have that I have integrity and dignity and honor and respect today I mean I walk in somewhere and if if I don't feel that I bring the room to that you know what I mean it's like come on come on bring it up a notch and and Charlie is the kind of guy who who respects that so much and in doing so I've been able to retire and being able to retire I've been able to throw myself into working with drunks and the book talks about you know um, when everything else fails work with a drunk and I don't think that's necessarily everybody's first idea yippee can't wait yeah, didn't you hear I need 200 bucks? I don't want to go to the drunk tank and talk to a bunch of drunks. And yet it's the best thing in the world for me. And so my morning prayer and meditation is I'm a very disciplined person has turned out to be where I do the two-way prayer to God. And my pen writes, help me see who I can help today. Every day. It's like, really? This self-centered alcoholic who could really care less? really wants to help others, and I do. And, and what it has opened my eyes to that's really amazing, I'm only at four minutes, so you can just wait there, Missy. Uh, I know all our scene is thinking about right now is what she's going to say. What am I going to say? What am I going to say? And, uh, but, uh, but, you know, I, I swear, whenever it gets ready to be your turn, you're like... Uh, it's, but one of the things I can tell you is I ask God, open my eyes to anybody I can help, a drunk or not. And, I'm, and I'll tell you a really unique story. I'm at the gym and I'm working out. And that's my, you know, my life is at the gym. I spend a couple hours there a day and it's normal for me. And, and this absolutely beautiful girl just pops right here to me. Huh, pops, you know, just like a ninja. And... Uh, <laughs> And so I was like, I was a bit startled, you know, I pulled my earbuds out and I said, hey, and you know, she goes, and she's beautiful. She says, I'm from Italy and I've been in the country for a year. And, you know, I'm thinking, God, my husband's not here. Uh, That was my first thought, you know, but I'll talk to you. And uh, and she said, uh, she said, you know, I uh, I just, you know, you you look great. You know, what do you do? Blah, blah, blah. And I'm, and I'm talking to her, and I'm thinking that's a normal conversation, right? Now, remember, every morning I'm, I'm saying, open my eyes, God, to who I can help. And, and then about three minutes into the conversation, she says, are you married? And I said, yeah. And she goes, are you happily married? And I said, I'm very happily married. And she just burst into tears. And she said, I, I'm, I'm not. I'm, my husband is a sex addict. Go figure. Right? I thought, okay, God. I really needed to go in about five minutes, but what you got here for me? And, uh, you know, and the next thing you know, I got her phone number. I gave her four of my girls' numbers, and then I had somebody that was in a Love Addiction Anonymous caller. See, and to me, that's what I told God. I said, just keep me an open channel. Because there was a time I used to be so in my head because I had a, well, I had a list. And I still do. 
But sometimes I can realize that I need to just stop because my list never works out for me. It just doesn't work. Nobody does what I think they should. And so when I stop and realize, okay, God, show me what you want me to do next, that's new for me, guys. I'm, t- I'm almost 30 years sober, and that is not of my nature. You know, and the, I love the third step prayer says, you know, well, it says God does not make too hard a terms for those who seek him. Well, where the heck are those terms in the book? Well, they're in the third step. It says, stay close to him and perform his work well. He'll take care of everything I need. And I have really, really, i got to tell you, I've, I've done very well with this level of peace of mind that I think we're all searching for. And uh, I have peace of mind a lot. And my problems now that used to last for 10 days came down to 10 hours are now down to 10 minutes. And if a problem bothers me for more than a day, I'm really surprised. No one more than me is surprised, unless I can't find Marty, which for some reason she thinks she's got some highfalutin job that she can't call me back. But uh, she works in the criminal justice system, and somebody's killed somebody, and they're taking up my time. But uh, I will text her and go, are you in some sort of murder? Is there a murder in town? What's happening? I need you. You know, you shine the bat light in the sky. You know, Gotham City is on fire, Batman. I am losing it over here. And uh, but the but the truth of the matter is, is Marty calls me, and I mean, it just she just brings it down like that. She just bring, she gets me to see it from an entirely different angle. That's not of my nature. That is really God doing for me what I haven't couldn't do for myself. I still got two and a half more minutes. <laughs> I was going to talk about Charlie, but I think I'll leave him out right now. Uh, but the other thing, too, is that these grandchildren. You know, I get to have a do-over, and that's one of the greatest gifts in the world. And my grandson heard me say one time, I was talking to my daughter, because I want my funeral to be a huge celebration. I'm one of these people, I'm planning my own funeral. And so, and all my sponsees know about it, and I've already told them what I want, and everybody knows what I want, and, and it's a big deal. And uh, so I was telling my daughter, and my daughter goes, well, do you not want me to run it? I thought I was running it, and I had obviously given it to someone else to run it. And, and so, and so, I didn't hear. No, my grandson overheard the conversation, and he's seven, and he had just gotten the four agreements out of my purse, the little bitty book, and he had been reading it, and he was reading it to me, and he was having trouble sounding out some words, but he's a pretty smart kid. And I asked him, I said, you know what that's saying? And he actually comprehended it. It was unbelievable. And so I said to him, he comes in, he goes, Graham, are you dying? And I said, oh, honey, no. And April goes, did you hear Graham talking about her funeral again? <laughs> and, uh, and I said, oh, Max, I'm so sorry. I felt terrible, right? And so then he said, well, can I, can I, can I speak at your funeral? And I said, oh, you absolutely can speak at my funeral. And this is what he did. He's very, very theatrical. He goes, this is what I'm going to do, Graham. I'm going to get up there and go, my Graham gave me this book. And let me tell you what this book says. And I swear, I just thought, well, I can die now. That's what I thought. I just go now. I'm at 10 minutes. Thanks. I'm Larsine, grateful member of Al Anon. Katie, Katie, Katie. <laughs> What is it? One, two, three, four. Fifth member of the Katie Show. Uh, <laughs> Welcome to my world. I know. You know, this is the second time I have had to follow Katie. And um, I don't know how many signs from God you need, girl, but you really do need to go to Al Anon. I mean, I don't know how many times you got to hear it. <laughs> I'm sorry, but did you not hear her say she was planning her old damn funeral? Holy crap. You only hear that in Al Anon, all right? Give me a break. <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> okay, the gifts of sobriety. Woo! Um, you know, um, when I think about the gifts of sobriety, my husband is sober, and that is a precious, precious gift. I can't even tell you how much that means to me and to my family and to our children. And he's been sober a long time, so he's got to be a sober dad. 
You've got to be a sober grandpa, which they call him Papa. They call me Grandma. Thank you very much, Katie. And uh, I like the name up until today. <laughs> but that's the name they gave me. I didn't pick one for myself. <laughs> Because I really love my grandkids, and I. <laughs> oh, I can't help it. She brings it out in me. I just. <laughs> I'm gonna have to call my sponsor, report myself. It's a mess. I don't... <laughs> and one of the very, very precious gifts of sobriety too is that of laughter and that of fun and that of being able to have fun with alcoholics. Who knew? Who knew it was going to be fun, you know? And um, and it really and truly is. And I love it, and I love being uh, with alcoholics. And like I say, and and my husband's sobriety is a precious, precious gift to me. And um, and everybody who I know that is sober is this precious, precious gift to me. Because I do know your families, and I know how much it means to them. You know, and even when that sobriety isn't of high quality, you know, it's a start. You know, and I know that when you come to rooms like this and you hang out with people like this, you know, then, then a certain uh, quality of sobriety starts to come to you, as Donna was talking about, you know, because you do want to be better people. You know, and I strive every day to be a better person in my Al-Anon program as well. And many, many times my husband has been the inspiration for that as well. And we were talking at dinner and I was saying, you know, um, he has to eat all the special stuff because of his liver disease and salt. And, I mean, it's just this big drawn-out thing, and he really has to knock himself out to eat right. And one time I told him, oh, for Pete's sake, why don't you just have a freaking piece of pizza? You know, do something that's, you know, fun or whatever. You know, and he said to me, you know, Larsine, there's people praying for me all across this country. You know, and if I don't eat right, then I'm not honoring those prayers that are being said in my behalf. I know. Who knew? Again. <laughs> Again. And that's why sobriety, I hear a lot, you know, a lot of, of, of the good that I have in my life, you know, a lot of the program that I have is a direct result of hanging out with people in Alcoholics Anonymous who willingly share that with me. You know, I ask that if you're in AA, you know, that you open your minds to the family members, you know, that are in Al-Anon too, because they don't know any better. I mean, it's scary. You know, you come here and you just don't know. Uh, when my husband was first sober, I was not in Al-Anon because I was not the problem, okay? You, he gets sober and I'll be okay. And... And, uh, and in the beginning, he loved going to Alcoholics Anonymous meetings, and he liked going. I mean, he would get in the car and drive everywhere. And there's a million meetings right by where we live, but he'd want to go to Malibu or Santa Monica or whatever, which is, you know, it, it's a little bit of a drive for us. And so he'd always ask me to go with him because he didn't want to go alone. And I was paranoid to go with him to Alcoholics Anonymous meetings, just paranoid, because I was afraid you would think I was an alcoholic. I was. I'm just being honest with you. And I told him, I go, you know, how are they going to know I'm not an alcoholic? You know, and he goes, don't worry, they'll know. And, uh, <laughs> and I thought that was like a compliment, you know, that's how stupid I am at the time. <laughs> and, you know, now today, a lot of people think I'm an alcoholic. And, I mean, I couldn't be more honored when they do. I mean, it's just like, I am not kidding. I love it when they think I'm an alcoholic. It's really, I always have people there telling me, oh, we're saving a seat for you. Jennifer will tell you. They're always telling me, we're saving a seat for you. You've got to be an alcoholic because you're too crazy not to be. And, uh, and so I drink every 90 days just to make sure I don't get in, you know, just in case. So. <laughs> have a half a glass of wine. <laughs> um. But the other deal, you know, for me, too, you know, and in sobriety, too, and I can't believe this, but when I was sharing with you and I was talking about, you know, my son Earl and my fear about him, you know, I forgot to tell you that that kid at 37 years old, he's nine months sober, you know, an Alcoholics Anonymous. And, um, and I got up to the room and I was talking to my husband and I go, oh, shit, I forgot to tell him Earl was sober, you know, and, uh, you know, and, 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 and again, one more time, what he said is good for you because it wasn't about him. It's about you. You know, and I mean, and, and you know, and again, what a testament it is to Al-Anon. You know, I'm so grateful. I am over the moon that my son is nine months sober and Alcoholics Anonymous. But I'm more over the moon that you guys taught me about unconditional love. You know, and, that, and, and all that means is that there's no conditions to it. There's no conditions to it. Unacceptable behavior is unacceptable behavior, and I don't have to tolerate that. But there's nothing that my son or anybody in my life that I love can do that can make me not love them. 
you know, and that's a real precious gift. You know, and it always blows my mind that I had to come to a room full of strangers to learn how to love my own family, but that's exactly what has happened to me in these rooms, so I can't thank you enough for that. Thanks. alcoholic. Hi, you know, I wear these skirts that are have elastic waist, and if you step on them, walking up the steps or getting out of a chair, it comes all the way down. <laughs> <laughs> I've had that happen at conferences, too, and they were not all women. <laughs> I'm still wearing them, though. Uh, anyway, the gifts of sobriety. I there are so many gifts of my sobriety, I, I, I don't even know where to start. The very first gift of my sobriety is being a sober woman, Alcoholics Anonymous, and having the self-respect and the self-esteem that I, I have today. But I'm going to share something that I wasn't going to share because of you, Katie. Uh-huh. <laughs> and I don't have... <laughs> I was, I was wearing this big old necklace so my, my cleavage wouldn't show, but it just got too hot. <laughs> no, and Polly remembers this. This is a gift. Um, one of the greatest gifts is the ability to love the unlovable and to have a loving relationship with my mom. Now, my mom died of cancer. When I was three months sober, my mom came back into the program, and she got sober. She got four years of sobriety. And it was a great experience for the two of us. But she did not get a sponsor. She did not work the steps, read the book. What she did is she went to cable producing school because it had just started in Long Beach. And she was the sec- second cable producer in Long Beach. And she started doing this show called High on Life. And it was all about sobriety. And she won a lot of awards. Now she's hanging out with other producers and all this. And, and uh, she starts drinking again. And we're having some battles about this show of hers, and so she changed the name to Senior City. Anyway, she came down with cancer, and my mom's dying. And my mom decides she wants to have her funeral before she dies. <laughs> Don't give her any idea. I'll be there. <laughs> so my sister and I, I mean, we just took it. We ran with it because she was very serious. She didn't want to model and thing after she died. She wanted her funeral before she died. So we called it the Awake Wake. (laughs) And um, we had caterers come cater it. Well, the caterers had notified the newspaper. And um, now remember, my mom's on morphine and she's drinking. And I'm getting a little bit of a resentment through all this because... (laughs) Okay, I get up in the morning. This newspaper, the Long Beach newspaper, came out and they took pictures and interviewed her and all of her friends and all that stuff. I got up in the morning... And the whole front page was a picture of my mom and all of this stuff, and it said, The Awake Week. And I'm thinking, oh, my God. (laughs) And um, the Associated Press picked it up. So now it goes all over the United States, The Awake Week. And now we're getting all these uh, talk shows calling us. They want my mom to go on their show before she dies. My mom is loving it. I mean, she is so excited. She doesn't even know she's dying. You know, she's just, she's so excited. And I'm resentful because she's drinking on top of morphine. And I'm thinking, why are all these things happening? Anyway, this, the show she decided on was Maury Povich. And um, <laughs> Maury Povich really likes drama. <laughs> And I have a very normal sister. My sister really wanted to go on the Maury Povich show with her. But they uh, did not want my sister. They wanted my daughter and me because we're alcoholics. <laughs> How they found out, I don't know. So I was so resentful at the time. But now one of the greatest gifts I have is this show of my mom, my daughter, myself, and my sister. They interviewed her in the, in the audience. And it's, you know, I thought the whole gift was for her, and I didn't realize the gift was for me to have in the years to come. 
Now, believe it or not, we've got uh, TV shows calling this now, NBC, CBS. They want to do a TV series, a TV show for whatever they call it. It's a movie for TV on my mom. Now, all this stuff is just uh, boggling <laughs> my brain. And uh, they decide, uh, they wrote the treatment. I didn't like the treatment. They made my sister and I enemies. Uh, but anyway, they had Carol Burnett playing the part. I, and I mean, just all this unbelievable stuff with my mom. And I don't, I've only shared this once before. But it, it, and I just found, I was going through some stuff the other night and I came across the treatment. And it's all when my mom died, the, the, the movie fizzled out. But it was still, it was just fun reading it. And it was fun knowing my mom died having fun. You know, she got her 15 minutes of fame, which she, she always wanted. You know, she was very dramatic, much like you. Yes. <laughs> much like Katie. Katie really reminds me of my mom. Oh. I'm sorry, sweetheart. <laughs> so anyway, that's one of the gifts of sobriety, but... The gift to, unlo- uh, to love the unlovable has been the greatest gift. Working with others has been one of the greatest gifts. I could not, I mean, I in the psychiatric effort, you know, I was told I could never love somebody unless I learned to love myself. And it was just the opposite. I came in here and I started working with unlovable people and I started loving them. And as I started loving and working with others, I started loving myself. I became a, a woman I respected, and I had a, a lot of self-esteem. Another great gift that came to me in my sobriety is Polly. I was 10 years sober when I got her in my life, and um, I had accomplished a lot in my sobriety in that 10 years, a lot. But I was going through a, a, a period where I was working too much, going to school, and not going to meetings, and I almost drank. I was at a birthday party for Debbie Reynolds, and it was just um, representing the, the company I was business manager for. And I am just so thankful the gift that it's the gift of grace, the gift of grace that I didn't drink that night because I was so uneasy with all these movie stars. And the only reason why I didn't take that drink that night is because my coworkers knew I was sober in the program of Alcoholics Anonymous, and I didn't want to embarrass this program. But... I'll tell you, I got my, I wish I could say I got my fanny into a meeting right then, but I didn't. I planned on taking a drink the next day where nobody would see me. And um, the next day I was asked to pay a 12-step call on a makeup artist who hadn't shown up at work for two weeks. And he was held up in a motel. The motel's trying to get him out. So they um, called my executive director to see what uh, we could do. And, of course, she approached me and asked me to go pay a 12-step call on him. And I was not thrilled about it. It interfered with my plans. I mean, honest to God, I sat there at that at that dinner, at the, at the dinner for Debbie Reynolds, and I sat there thinking, you know, maybe now that I have this impressive job and I have an education and I drive a new car and I have this cute, maybe I'm really not an alcoholic. May, I'm not that little girl from the other side of the tracks anymore. I mean, just like that, two weeks without a meeting that kind of thinking kicked in. So I got a guy to go with me to pay this 12-step call on this makeup artist, and he opened the door. If I said Michael Alcoholic, he opened the door. I wouldn't have opened the door. And he was 10 times his normal size. He was profusely sweating. He was bleeding from head to toe because he kept falling into objects. He smelled of urine, he smelled of alcohol, and he smelled of vomit. And I didn't even recognize him because he's a makeup artist. He had hair but this guy's bald so I just stood there speechless I didn't even know what to say but that man doesn't know it he's the one who paid the 12 step call on me because I got my meeting my fanny into a meeting that night and I recommitted to this program and since that day I've gone to more meetings than I've ever gone to I work with more alcoholics than I've ever worked with and I got Polly as a sponsor because my sponsor had died and she's the one that dropped kicked me into speaking thank you very much Polly and it's a gift. It's a gift. I never would have met my husband if I didn't have the ability to walk through fear. And that's the, the other gift that Sprite has given me is the ability to walk through fear. And my husband is a southern gentleman. He is just awesome. He's, 
I, I love, we've been married almost 19 years. I've never been with anybody 19 years, not even my mom. <laughs> I, left my, I left my mom when I was 15. So it's just, it's just a gift, and I just, I love him so much. I'm, I'm kind of sick of this, this saying of yet to do um, with our grandchildren. We get a do-over. <laughs> well, we've got a 17-year-old granddaughter, 18-year-old grandson, 20-year-old grandson, and the do-over is kind of wearing us out. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I mean, because I'm, we're raising the 17-year-old. She's living in our house. The two boys are off. Their dad died. It, it was tragic, but they're off running around. And but I keep telling my husband, "Honey, this is this is just a do-over." <laughs> no, <laughs> but I really love these boys, my grandsons. I, I love them so much, and I'm just praying for them. I say the third step prayer for a minute, and that's all I can do, and uh, and wait and see what happens. Um, the other gift of my sobriety that I am so very thankful for is 18 years ago I started working with the military in Augusta, Georgia. It's a treatment center. And they were get, they were coming out saying all these wild things at meetings like uh, um, autobiography was an inventory, uh, confronting their parents was amends. And so I went to the counselors and I said, I asked if they could come to my house on Wednesday night for a barbecue and a big book study. And they let me do that. And so for um, 18 years, they have been coming to my house every Wednesday night. I did not know at that time that I would need them, you know, because I've gone through many surgeries, back surgeries, knee replacements. I've had more than the normal person. And if it wasn't for those soldiers, every Wednesday night, the book, the book says nothing will so much ensure immunity to drinking as intensive work with others. And I want you to know when they were coming back from Iraq, it was intense. It, it was in, unbelievably intense. But I, I love them so much, and I especially love my two soldiers that came with me today. They're no longer soldiers. They're women in the community that we're very proud of, and my husband and I had adopted them. And that's Amanda and Airplane Anna. <laughs> And my, uh, my husband says they're the daughters that he's never had, but they're so much more to me. And um, so many gifts, just too many gifts to ever explain. And you'll never really know until you throw yourself in this program and start working with others and see the gifts that God brings to you. Thank you. I'm Patty. I'm an alcoholic. Patty. Grateful to be sober and grateful to be here. And I'll tell you what, I could not wait to get back up to this podium because Friday night when I talked, I did not know there was a big screen. <laughs> <laughs> I thought, let me get up there. I want to see how I look. And I'm... <laughs> it's not bad, really. Um... <laughs> Don't be cutting into my time like that. Um, I just want to tell Katie, put me on the uh, list for invitations for the funeral. I have, I have some things I want to say. I, um, but the condition this woman's in, you don't want to say them while she's still alive. So, you know. Okay, so... So... When Sandy introduced me Friday night, what I wanted her to read from the book, Alcoholics Anonymous, she explained to me, I can't read that. It's not about steps one and two. And so now I can read it. Here's. <laughs> um, it's in the chapter, Working with Others. It says, never avoid these responsibilities, but be sure you are doing the right thing if you assume them. Helping others is the foundation stone of your recovery. A kindly act once in a while isn't enough. You have to act the Good Samaritan every day, if need be. It may mean the loss of many nights' sleep, great interference with your pleasures, interruptions to your business. It may mean sharing your money and your home, counseling frantic wives and relatives, innumerable trips to police courts, sanitariums, hospitals, jails, and asylums. 
Your telephone may jangle at any time, day or night. Your wife may sometimes say she is neglected. A drunk may smash the furniture in your home or burn a mattress. You may have to fight with him if he is violent. Sometimes you will have to call a doctor and administer sedatives under his direction. Another time you may have to send for the police or an ambulance. Occasionally you will have to meet such conditions. And, uh, and I wrote in the paragraph, sign me up. Sign me up. The greatest gift I've been given in Alcoholics Anonymous is the opportunity to put myself in a position where I can be divinely inconvenienced uh, by men and women who need um, the program that we have, to be in a position to help others. I'm selfish and self-centered. That's what came to the door. I have done very little. I admitted to my innermost self I was alcoholic. I came to believe the people in AA were telling me the truth. I made a decision to do what you said you had done. I wrote about my favorite topic, me. I bored somebody for about an hour and a half listening to it, and as a result, I'm in a position where the seven-step prayer says, take all of me, good and bad. I don't have to judge it. Leave me with all I need to be of service to you and my fellows. The greatest gift I have ever been given, an opportunity to be of service to God and his fellows. But I have eight more minutes, so... um <laughs> It seems, yeah, really, it seems um, that we're talking, a lot of people, these women who I love, these women are incredibly powerful women, and uh, it's just such an honor to be part, stop, this is my time, stop, <laughs> uh, but a lot of talk about relationships, so I'm going to talk, I'm going to tell you the, my, the gift of relationship for me. My son, who was uh, 11 months old, when I came to you, I brought him with me because I didn't know what to do with him. I mean, he's 11 months old. What do you do? You can't leave him at home. And uh, <laughs> so I brought him to AA, and the people in AA, you held him, you loved him. I don't know what you did with him. And at the end of the meeting, you'd give him back. And <laughs> I, brought him, uh, I brought him to meetings, and you, and you took care of him. You taught him how to love, be kind, be generous, be giving, be nurturing. You also taught him how to con and manipulate. I've never been thrilled with that, but... Um, <laughs> Apparently, I take the good with the bad, and I like to share that because if uh, just sitting in meetings were enough, my son wouldn't have had a problem, but my son had a journey that he had to go on, a journey that alcoholic men go on. He went to places no human being should go. He did things no human being should do, and I got in the ring with his disease. I'm powerless over alcohol. I'm powerless whether I'm fighting because I'm drinking it or I'm fighting because you're drinking it, and I got in the son ring with my son's disease, and I was getting beat up bad. I was wiring him. He called me one time from San Francisco. I'm in Southern California. He'd had an accident. He needed stitches. It was going to cost $120. I said, oh, my God, give me the address of the hospital. I'll send a check. He said, oh, no, they need cash. And I said, well, I'm in Southern California. I don't know how to do that. And he taught me how to wire money. <laughs> and I wired the money, and I wired the money. I had pretty soon I had seven money gram stores going because I didn't want the clerk to know I was sending the money one more time. And, and I went to Al-Anon. God bless Al-Anon. I went to Al-Anon, and... Uh, and one day, at an, after an Al-Anon meeting, one of those Al-Anon women came up to me and she said, Patty, you're, a, you're an active member of Alcoholics Anonymous. She said, go back there. You are giving us a bad name. And, uh, <laughs> and it wasn't for lack of trying. I just couldn't do the things that they, were, that they were asking me to do. I could not do it. I sent the money. I took the phone calls. I verbally abused him. I cussed at him. I did whatever I did. And, and the thing I did right is I came to AA and I told you. I told you I sent the money. I told you I cussed at him. I told you. And the men and women of Alcoholics Anonymous kind and lovingly said to me, Patty, aren't you embarrassed? You're 23, 24 years in sober. Aren't you embarrassed to be sharing this? I want you to know this. If I am ever too embarrassed to tell you the truth, I'm going to be drunk. And I don't want to be drunk anymore. So the gift is, the gift is I can come here and tell you the truth. And on October 23rd, 2000. Two, I got a phone call one more time at work and with my son, and God did for me what I could not do for myself because he asked for help one more time, and I said these words that I would never have spoken. I said, Patrick, I can't help you anymore. Stay where you are, and I'll send somebody from Alcoholics Anonymous. And I called the guy that, thank God I called this guy. God dialed the number. I didn't call him. I called this guy that understood the traditions because he didn't say, tell the boy to call me. He said, where is he? And I gave him the address of that motel, and he got a newcomer, and they brought him to AA. And for almost 12 years now, my son and I have enjoyed this journey together. And, um, all right. 
and uh, and it's and it's it's a tremendously tremendously great gift to share Alcoholics Anonymous with with your child. And um, he and I shared a pitch one night. He was a 10 minute speaker. I was the main speaker, and he was talking to a room of about 200 people. And uh, he grew up without a father. I've been a single parent his whole life. He grew up without a father, and he was sharing about the pain of growing up without a father and the angst of it. And I never knew. I never knew it caused him any problem. And all of a sudden, he looked at these 200 people, and he said, but my mother's a blackout drinker, and I may never know who my father is. And I thought, oh, God, you just outed me as a slut. (laughs) (laughs) And it, too, was the greatest gift. It was a gift. And none of us who are parents, we never rocked our infant child and thought, oh, honey, one day one of my greatest gifts is to share a podium at a meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous. And and because my son's an active member of Alcoholics Anonymous, they made it a, he was chair of the uh, ACIPOC conference, all California young people. If, If you have a lack of enthusiasm in your program, go to a young people's event. It's like an IV of enthusiasm. Any Wi-Fi event I've ever been to, I've come out of it like floating. It's a, just an IV of enthusiasm. But uh, he was he chaired the Saturday night meeting, and they asked me to speak at that meeting. And so because he chaired the meeting, he introduced the speaker. And he said, I want to introduce tonight's speaker, my mother, and my hero. Aww. And I started to cry. And I thought, you know, I stood in that courtroom when he was eight months old trying to make a decision to be doomed to an alcoholic death or to live on a spiritual basis. If I'd have made a different decision in that courtroom that morning, my son would have gone to a foster home, and he'd be introducing somebody else that night. Norm Alpey, who was one of the greatest speakers Alcoholics Anonymous ever said, ever had, Norm Alpey used to say seconds and inches. Seconds and inches if I'd have made a different decision that morning. And the only way to get from where I was on October 4th, 1975, to that podium that Saturday night was the power and the magic of the 12 steps of Alcoholics Anonymous. If you take in the action and the steps were exactly the way they're written in the book, I was allowed to be introduced that night as my son's mother and hero. And um, in December, I had to be in the hospital and um, it was Christmas. And Christmas, we, uh, we have a tradition at Christmas. My son and the mother of my grandson, they're not together, but the, my son and my grandson's mother, who he calls me Granny O., Except when he has something serious to tell me, then he calls me patio. <laughs> but, uh, he, uh, <laughs> we, have, with a, we all, the four of us are together on Christmas Eve, and Christmas morning, uh, Santa Claus comes, and then my son cooks breakfast, and then we have Christmas. And this year I was in the hospital at Christmas time, and my son, because he's a good man, because he came to Alcoholics Anonymous, because you showed him how to be a good man. My son, they, they came to the hospital that, on Christmas morning. They bought breakfast in the hospital cafeteria, which isn't where you want to eat a meal. They brought breakfast, and the three of them brought Christmas to my room. And we had breakfast, and we had Christmas, and at, they're getting ready to leave, and my grandson, who's seven, he's never done a single thing wrong. Yeah. <laughs> he looks at me, and he said, Granny, he said, it's not so bad here. He said, these people are nice. And I thought, you know what? I hope that every newcomer who comes to Alcoholics Anonymous, every newcomer who comes here, goes home to their husband, their wife, their mother, their father, their brother, their sister, whoever they go home to, that they go home after they've been with us and say, you know what? It's not so bad there. The people are nice. And it's my responsibility. It's my joy. It's my gift to be the person in the room in Alcoholics Anonymous to put my hand out and let that person know, you know what, it's not so bad. The people are nice. Thank you. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.